on the Monday after the race at Imola, staff at the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Sweden were alarmed to see high rates of radiation in the atmosphere. After some panic checking of seals and a bit of reconnaissance by the Swedish Air Force, it was established that a cloud of radiation was heading northwest out of the USSR. The Swedish government sent an inquiry to the Soviet government about what was going on. The Soviet government denied everything, but when Sweden said that in that case they were going to have to file a report with the International Atomic Energy Authority, the Soviet authorities admitted that there had been a minor accident in a 20-second matter-of-fact report buried at the end of the nightly news. It was nonetheless the first time the Soviet Union had admitted to any form of nuclear accident. The next day, an American reconnaissance satellite took photos of the site, showing the roof of the reactor blown off and a smoking, glowing mass inside. In the following days, the Soviet authorities continued to play down the incident, insisting that the May Day parades in Kiev and Minsk go ahead to reassure the public that everything was normal, despite a huge cloud of radioactive fallout drifting over both cities. The wind changed, blowing from the east, to start spreading the fallout across Poland and East Germany. School playgrounds in West Germany were closed, and people advised not to eat leafy vegetables, to stay indoors with the windows closed. Advised that Kiev Radio didn't give its citizens until 11 days after the disaster. Western Europe braced itself as its worst fears of nuclear winter seemed about to be realised. As you might imagine, the Chernobyl disaster occupied most of the headlines for the week leading up to the Monaco Grand Prix, Though there doesn't seem to have been any thought of cancelling the event, but there was also time to note the Diamond Jubilee of the Japanese Emperor Hirohito, who had led his nation into and through the Second World War. The World Exposition on Transport and Communication, Expo 86 for short, opened in Vancouver, with 54 nations as well as international and subnational exhibitors, such as the UN, the European Community and the State of California, demonstrating new technologies in the field. Liverpool won the English First Division for a record 16th time, defeating Chelsea 1-0 to seal the title. The goal was scored by Kenny Dalglish in his first season as player-manager. Just five days later, Liverpool added the FA Cup to their trophy cabinet, defeating Everton 3-1 in the first ever Merseyside Derby Cup final. And the European Cup Winners' Cup, meanwhile, was won by Dynamo Kiev, who defeated Atletico Madrid 3-0 in Lyon, despite the dire news from back home. And the Eurovision Song Contest was held in Oslo, seeing a debut for Iceland, whose song came 16th out of 20. The contest was won by 13-year-old Sandra Kim for Belgium, with the song J'aime la vie, I love life. Following her win, the minimum age for competitors was set at 16, so Sandra's record will likely never be broken. The Grand Prix teams arrived at Monaco, as usual ready for Thursday practice, and the only change to the lineup from Imola was that Patrick Tombay was now also in a Ford powered THL2 chassis. There was much paddock gossip about Ed and Senna, who claimed he'd already signed an option with a new team for next year, and with Gianni Agnelli, head of Ferrari owners, Fiat to- in attendance and praising the Brazilian to the high heavens, the smart money was on Senna in a Ferrari for 1987, though others thought Brabham was the more likely option. As ever, Monaco was unforgiving in practice and qualifying, as teams can never test there, and drivers mostly only get to drive it once a year. There were some changes to the circuit this year too, as the fast left-right flick after the tunnel had been turned into a proper chicane to slow cars as they emerged blind at 170 miles an hour, while the tabac rascas antony Noge complex that ended the lap had been reprofiled slightly, which eliminated an artificial island and some curbing on the exit to the start-finish straight. All of which meant that Thursday's qualifying times looked very topsy-turvy. No particular surprises with Senna and Rosberg at the top, but Arnoux was third, Berger fifth, Jones sixth, Piquet down in thirteenth, and Mansell and Dumfries both in the DNQ zone. Saturday afternoon's qualifying saw an early accident by De Cesaris drop oil all over Tabak, which led to everyone staying in until it had been cleared. Mansell went out and fastest, and then all hell broke loose as 26 cars tried to find a gap in the dying minutes. Almost unnoticed, Prost went round on his last lap and snatched pole, just as Jones's front suspension collapsed under braking and put him in the barriers, thankfully with no ill effects. There was also a potentially nasty incident in the overcrowded pit lane on Saturday when Stefan Johansson's Ferrari clipped Renault boss Jean Sage, giving him a nasty cut on the scalp, which bled everywhere and looked very dramatic, but thankfully turned out not to be serious. So Prost took his first pole of the year, with Mansell alongside, and Senna third, alongside Alboreto, who was still vocal in his criticism of the car, but had taken it by the scruff of the neck. 
then Berger and Patrese, whose Brabham seems to be running well for once. Tom Bay a fine eighth on his first attempt in the new car, Rosberg back in ninth, PK eleventh, Johansson fifteenth, Jones eighteenth, and Palmer and De Angelis making up the back row, with both the Zellers, both Minardis, Rothengatter, and surprisingly Dumfries watching from the sidelines. The Lotus driver, at his first Monaco race, had crashed early in free practice and had no chance to get the hang of the track before Thursday's session, and then an attack of Lotus gearbox on Saturday stopped him from improving his times. With the Grand Prix traditionally starting late so Prince Rainier could have his lunch first, the teams had some time on Sunday morning to tweak and tinker, but even so, when the cars lined up for the dummy grid, there were two missing. Both Tombe and Lafitte had had oil leaks during the warm-up and were both being hastily switched to the spare cars, which were both set up for their respective teammates. The Haas engineers managed to get Patrick's seat, pedals, steering wheel and so on swapped in time, but his fellow Frenchman was still strapping on his helmet when they went off for the formation lap, but got away in time to line up at the back rather than starting from the pit lane. So, under gloriously blue skies, the lights went green and Prost made a perfect start to retain his lead while Mansell was outdragged by Senna as they squeezed through saint Vot without incident for a change. Rosberg got a good start to go through the first corner sixth, then took fifth off Berger at Mirabeau, while Brundle, starting in the 015 Tyrrell for the first time, was also going great guns in eighth. Rosberg's being held up by Alboreto, whose Ferrari wasn't handling well, but was made wide enough to stymie Kecky's attempts to get past. So on lap three, it was Prost leading Senna, Mansell, Alboreto and Rosberg, with Berger, Petrese, Brundle, Tombe and Piquet in pursuit. Further back, Jones and Streff tangled at Tabak. Both drivers were pushed out of the way, one marshal nearly hit by Prost as he came by, but while Streff was still running and could continue, Jones's engine had stopped, and in any way he was pushed the wrong way round the track, which would have disqualified him even if he had kept it running. Prost was by now pulling out quite a lead over Senna, who had Mansell right on his tail, just as Alboreto had Rosberg, and indeed behind them Berger and Petrese were also running nose to tail. With so few overtaking opportunities and the need to conserve tyres and spare gearboxes, nothing much changed over the initial laps, except that Petrese inveigled his way past Berger off-camera to nab 6th, and further back Johansson and Lafitte were having a fine scrap over 13th. On lap 16, Rosberg finally got a slingshot past Alboreto to take 4th round the outside at St. Devot, and rapidly began to pull away from the Ferrari and close in on 3rd placed Mansell. By lap 20, about a quarter distance, as the leaders lapped a struggling Elio De Angelis, Prost had a considerable lead over Senna, but the next three were closing up, as Rosberg, on softer rear tyres than most others, gained on Mansell at a rate of knots, despite Mansell setting fastest lap. De Angelis came in to chat to Herbie Blash about his engine, while Fabi gave up with dodgy brakes. As Senna, Mansell and Rosberg continued closing up, attention turned to a five-car train just behind the points positions, as seventh-placed Arnoux led Brundle, Tombe, Piquet and Lafitte through the backmarkers, including Streff, which confused the situation further as one Tyrrell lapped the other. Piquet, stuck in the middle of this, was a well-known hater of Monaco, and this wouldn't improve his opinion of the place any. While the cameras were watching that, Rosberg got ahead of Mansell on lap 26, and was now chasing down Senna. When Senna got stuck behind Boots and Arrows for half a lap, Rosberg made up time, as Mansell came in for a tyre change, rejoining fifth. When Senna ran wide at Mirabeau, Rosberg was right on his tail, but dived into the pits for a new set of tyres shortly afterwards. A sluggish 13.2 second stop putting him out right behind Alboreto, while Petrese came in on the same lap, overshot his pit and stalled the engine into the bargain, finally being restarted and sent back out, with his race now thoroughly ruined. Prost was by now nearly 20 seconds ahead of Senna, but the Brazilian was on harder tyres and hoping to get through without a stop. On fresh rubber, Rosberg got past Alboreto at the same place as last time, albeit with considerably more ease, and then on the next lap, Prost came in for tyres, making a quick stop and getting out just behind Senna, as he approached a group of backmarkers. Senna got through them quicker though, and actually expanded the gap to over 7 seconds by the time Prost had made it through on the stroke of half distance. Alboreto came in to retire with a turbo failure, remarkably only the fourth retirement so far, as Prost promptly took two seconds out of Senna's lead again once clear of the traffic. After another couple of laps, Prost was right behind the Lotus, and about 15 seconds ahead of Rosberg in third, with Mansell, Arnoux and Berger making up the top six. Prost tried Rosberg's manoeuvre, but Senna was having none of it, though it was clear the momentum was with the McLaren, and after a couple of laps of defensive driving, Senna came in for tyres. Bob Dunn's and the Lotus mechanics turned Senna around in just over nine seconds, and he rejoined third just ahead of Mansell. 
On fresh tyres, Ayrton was easily able to leave Nigel behind, while behind them, Nelson Pico had finally made his way up into the top six. Rosberg, an accomplished street racer who seemed to finally be finding his feet at McLaren, was on a charge again, cutting the gap to his teammate down to some 11 seconds before Prost sped up, set a couple of fastest laps and stabilised the gap. And by lap 50 out of 78, with all the tyre stops done, that was about it for racing, as the final third of the race petered out into a widely dispersed procession. Both Brabham's had fallen by the wayside, Patrese after 38 laps with a broken fuel pump, and De Angelis after 31 with engine failures, and Berger's steering broke. Piquet's miserable afternoon was capped when a charging Lafitte took six from him, and there was a lively accident on lap 67, when Patrick Tombe made a rather ambitious move on Brundle, hit him, and did a barrel roll, nearly landing on a pavement cafe and scattering spectators, and nearly collecting Mansell to boot, who had been trying to catch Senna. Tombe was out on the spot, needless to say, while Brundle limped back towards the pit lane with a flat tyre but didn't quite make it. He'd taken a blow to the head during the accident, but it was apparently none the worse for wear. And so Alain Prost won his third Monaco Grand Prix in a row, maintaining a 100% record of winning in the Principality in a McLaren, with Rosberg second and Senna third, Mansell fourth and the Ligiers making up the points. Piquet finished just out of the points ahead of the Arrows twins, with Johansson, Streff and Palmer making an unusually high number of finishes with only eight retirements all race. So Prost took the lead in the driver's standings, three points ahead of Senna, who was now four ahead of PK, and Rosberg was up into fourth, while McLaren's 1-2 finish saw them move nine points clear of Williams to the head of the constructors' standings. The teams all packed up to head home and prepare for the Belgian Grand Prix, with some stopping off en route at Paul Ricard for a test session.